Welcome to Your Daily Dose, a devotion ministry of the Faith Baptist Church of Franklin and Middletown, Ohio. Thanks for joining us each weekday as we share God's Word with you. It's your daily prescription for all that ails you. And now, Your Daily Dose. Well, it's good to be with you again for another Daily Dose here from Faith Baptist Church in Franklin, Ohio. I'm Doug Krause, the youth pastor. You know, as a youth pastor who's been one for 39 years now, I have made many mistakes. I recall one time that I had taken our youth group on a tour of Christian colleges throughout the South, and we told them that we would have a off day while we were traveling through Florida looking at schools, and we would go to Universal Studios for a nice outing. It was my first experience there with a moving sidewalk. I had grown up in Franklin, Ohio, and we were just happy to have sidewalks. We certainly didn't know what to do with a moving one. And I got on it, and I kept turning around, instructing our teens how to behave, how to handle a moving sidewalk so as not to bother anyone else. However, As I was continuing to give them instruction, the sidewalk came to an end. I did not see that coming, and of course, I stumbled significantly forward. I should also say that I was a couple hundred pounds heavier, and so as I stumbled forward, the only thing that kept me from face planting was the fact that I grabbed hold of an elderly lady. And I mean, I grabbed hold of her just to prevent myself from falling. And she and I took several stumbles forward before I was able to release her. I apologized profusely, but it did not seem to help. And uh, I can simply say that mistakes were definitely made. Now, if you're going to go through this life, uh, you're going to make mistakes too. The world is certainly waiting to pounce on those things. And it might be good to remember how the world looks at us and what they ultimately would like to have happen to us. In 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 5, God gives us a combative approach to dealing with the world. In other words, how do we counteract what the world is going to come to us with? We're out there. We are very capable of mistakes, capable of sinful choices. What do we do? 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 5 says, Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God, and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Now, you know, God teaches us in this that we are to cast down, break from above us all the things that would lift up the world in the place where only Christ should be. It reminds us that we must capture every thought and hold it to being obedient unto Christ, that that's the way to combat the world. You know, let me say that it's important, Paul tells us here, of how to fight this world, because God knows that the world is against you and I as followers of Christ. The world is against God today. The If you do not believe that, stand up for biblical principles. Stand up for God's principles in the school or the workplace or in front of your neighbors or your brother-in-law. You're going to find out right quick how the world is against the things of God. And the world will reject you. If they reject Jesus, they will reject you. And 
they shall. Now, the world doesn't mind baby Jesus. They like baby Jesus. The world doesn't mind healing Jesus. They like healing Jesus. But the world doesn't like preaching Jesus. That Jesus the world's not in favor of, and they will not be in favor of you when you hold the world up to biblical standards and capture every thought and hold it against what the Word of God says. The world will come at you. They will challenge your type of thinking. The greatest infiltration that our world has to worry about, to be quite honest, it's not a terrorist group nor a virus. It is thought life that goes against the Word of God. And that has to be brought into captivity for yourself, for your family, for the church, and quite honestly, for the world. Now, how are we going to do what Paul said there in 2 Corinthians 5? How can we avoid those mistakes, those pitfalls? How can we uh, uh, not allow the world to mess us up? Well, we've got to have, in order to keep our thoughts captive, for the Word of God, we have to have a filter. We have to have something that we can run all of our thoughts through. And fortunately, God gives it to us. It's found in Philippians chapter 4, verse 8, and it lists six things, and then if we get them, two other things. Look what it says. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, Whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, and whatsoever things are of a good report. If there be any virtue, and if there be any praise, think on these things. Now, those six things, let me remind us about them quickly, if I can. He said, whatsoever things are true. True means real. You know, the closest thing that we have to reality, if you think about it, might very well be a brand new baby. A little baby that God knew before was pl it was placed in the mother's womb. A little baby that God chose to grow in the mother's womb for nine months. And then uh, we are blessed with and hold in our arms this miracle from God. On a side note, I believe when every baby is born, they ought to be considered nine months old uh, since they've been alive since that time of conception. But nonetheless, when you have that newborn baby, when you hold that baby in your arms, there's no way you don't know that that's real. And there's no way that you can't know that there is a God in heaven when you hold that little miracle. That, uh, that's real. That's true. You see, that creation, that reminds us that there's a creator. Listen, God's real. Jesus is real. The word of God is real. And the world is dying for real. The world is dying for truth. So we're told to think on the things that are true. Make the world filter through what is true. Secondly, what is honest. We think we know what honesty is. We think it's some old Boy Scout oath. And I was a Boy Scout years ago. But Hebrews chapter 11 says honesty is even a higher thing. It says it is the difference between being noble and being silly. It says it is something called integrity. Um, integrity is what you're doing when no one looks. I am reminded of a great example of honesty, of integrity. When you see people who serve in nursing home ministries, which get no attention and no applause, Nobody sees those ministries. They say that Jack Hiles, when he would travel, would get to a town and the first thing he would do 
would be to just drive and find a little nursing home. And he would walk in and he would say to pe- the, the people in charge of the nursing home, are there any patients that don't get a visit? He said, I'm a preacher. I'm not going to be mean. I just want to sit and talk to those that don't have any visits. I know of a man who for 40 some years would go to a nursing home every Sunday and lead them in song and no one knows his name and no one outside of his sons and his wife will ever remember that he did that. But those are honest things. Those are things of integrity. And we need to hold the world to that same kind of standard. Fill your mind with honesty. Thirdly, it says whatsoever things are just. Just is to do right. You know, when King Darius in uh, the book of Daniel, chapter 6 and verse 10, he had signed the decree that you couldn't bow down and worship anybody but him. Well, Daniel knew that the decree had been signed. And chapter 6, verse 10 says he knew that the writing had been signed, but yet he continued to worship and serve his God. You know, he could have hidden. Maybe he could have done it secretly. Maybe he could have stopped altogether and said, hey, I'll get in trouble. But instead, he was a just man. He did the right things. We have to fill our mind with what things are just. Are you a just man? Are you a just teenager? Fourth, whatsoever things are pure. Purity, I think of Joseph of the Old Testament. Potiphar's wife desired to be with Joseph, and Joseph rejected her. He underwent difficulty for uh, being a virtuous, just man. You know, when we think about that, we know that he didn't have friends who told him, don't be with Potiphar's wife. He didn't have a church that said, hey, Sunday morning we're preaching on don't don't uh, be with another man's wife. He didn't have that. He didn't have a youth pastor or a pastor that sat him down and said, hey, Joseph, don't do this. Um, he didn't have a... a mom and a dad that we know told him uh, not to do these things. In fact, he didn't even have a finished Bible to be instructed in these things. But yet he knew that he was to be pure. He resisted Potiphar's wife because he had a purity. You know, we're going to have to make the choice to have a purity. In this day and age of instant pornography, in this day and age of if it feels good, do it. No accountability. It's your life. Do what you want to do. Purity must be used as a filter of the world into our lives. And then the Bible says whatsoever things are lovely. Now, you know, lovely is not what we call a macho word. Um, my son-in-law, Luke, and his best friend, Derek, they ride to work every day and actually listen to these podcasts. And Luke and Derek, as they go to work and they work in the realm of cement construction, uh, these two buddies, I'm sure they don't sit on the construction site and say, Hey, uh, Derek, uh, that's a lovely hard hat you have there. And Derek doesn't look at Luke and say, well, you know, Luke, I I think the way you swing a pickaxe is just lovely. We don't associate lovely with manliness. And yet, it very clearly is. You know, in uh, 1 Samuel chapter 5, we're reminded of when uh, uh, David was a little upset with Nabal. And he was, in fact, upset enough because of how Nabal had been uh, ridiculous and churlish, the Bible calls it, 
that he mounted up his troops and he was going to go meet old Nabal and let him know what's what. But Nabal had a wife named Abigail. And Abigail knew how to be lovely. And she went in front of this battle and was lovely and kind and she appeased King David and his troops. And because of her loveliness, her kindness, because of that, there was an influence upon David that spared old Nabal's life. Now, God ended up taking him not too long after that. That was his fault. And David ended up marrying Abigail. Now, here's what we know, that to be lovely is not effeminate, it's not weak, it's wise, it's beautiful. It in itself is lovely. And let me say that people do not care how much you know until they know how much you care. So care about people. Be lovely. Filter the world through that. People need to be lovely. And then the sixth one is that people need to be of a good report. Joshua and Caleb were the only two of the 12 spies who came back from the promised land and said, hey, we can get in there and take that. Everybody else said, man, they're giants. We're going to get killed. Let's not go. Joshua and Caleb said, that's our land might be tough, but we can do it. You know, we need to have a testimony of being positive, especially in this day and age. That may not be how you normally are, but we are still commanded to be positive, not because we're confident in ourselves, but because we can be confident in our God. To have a testimony of a good report is the opposite of criticism. Criticism is easy. The world's got plenty of that. So does the church, unfortunately. So does the family, unfortunately. Are you going to fill your mind with negativity and criticism? Make it pass through the filter of a good report. Let's be positive about things. And if we're going to do these six things, then these two things can be there. To, to be virtuous. That's a morality. Young ladies, you deserve a virtuous. Young men, young man. Young men, you deserve a virtuous young lady. Can I say, wives, you still deserve a virtuous husband, no matter how long you've been married. And husband's a virtuous wife. You know, we don't blush anymore. But we need to get back to where we are virtuous. And if we do those six things, it sets us up to have the virtues that we need. And finally, it says, if there be any praise. You know, um, every so often, and the Bible in this portion about praise is a, a good reminder that all praise is given unto God. But as far as people seeing what you do, that's up to God. And every so often, someone may go wrong because of too much praise. But I promise you that for every one of those, surely ten die for lack thereof. I don't know where we got the idea that we should not see what people do and compliment that sincerely to encourage their hearts, to use a word to change their lives. Fill your mind with praise. Well, the world will challenge your thinking. You're going to have to filter it. Use these filters that God has given us. And as you do that, it's who you'll actually end up becoming. Bring every thought into captivity to combat a world that doesn't love and seek after God and therefore won't always love nor seek after you. But when you change 
and you filter the world through these things, it will change you and it will change what you can do for a world that needs Jesus. Thank you for spending a few minutes with us again today. God bless. This has been your Daily Dose, a ministry of Faith Baptist Church. Subscribe to our YouTube channel today and click the bell next to the button to sign up for email notifications each time we live stream or release a new video. To learn more about faith, please visit our website, fitinatfaith.com, for more information about our church. Have a great day in the Lord.